created to bring you fame. Tell of your wonders and to proclaim you are good. I was created to celebrate all of your goodness and all your grace. Tell of your wonders and to proclaim you are good. Pastor Deb, become associate pastor at Kingsway Church. Uh, I have to say this lady is God's answer to my prayers over many years and the prayers of our church. But we haven't officially uh, inducted her, that's the term they use in our denomination, into this role. So we felt we really needed to do this as soon as we can. And I'm absolutely thrilled that my great friend, Pastor Paul Chamberlain, is going to take this part of the service for us. He also happens to be Deb's father-in-law. What a father-in-law to have, can I say? What a father-in-law to say, can I have? Paul, come on, Ed. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Pastor John. Uh, I am seriously blessed today, folks. Um, purely, uh, well, not simply just because Pastor John's asked me to do this part of the service. Um, but actually, uh, 20 years ago next month is Adam Debs. Uh, well, it was their wedding. And, and I had the joy of officiating at it. Gal was the registrar, and I officiated 20 years ago today. So it's been a great joy and uh, a real blessing. Um, not only is she a great daughter-in-law, uh, some of you know her as a great friend uh, and confident. I see those in the gathering today. But also uh, as a, a, a teacher, a mother, and in every sense, a blessing. So I'm going to invite Deb to come up, and uh, then I'm going to pray with her. Do you know, it was... Um, just trying to work it through. It's over 10 years ago that we invited Deb to be uh, our children's pastor at Calvary Church. Do you know, it was one of those situations that became a no-brainer. Um, you know, you didn't have to have 
a flash of lightning from heaven to (laughs) realise that Deb was the obvious choice for children's pastor. And, uh, you know, success followed and great joy came. But equally at that time, we seriously uh, felt that there was an anointing of God upon her for ministry. And uh, anybody with any spiritual brain could see it. And uh, so uh, there was a group of some fantastic young people at that time who, who all had an anointing of God on them. And so today is very special, uh, not just for Deb, but for a lot of us. And, and more importantly, for this church. Because I always think that it's the flock of God that counts, more so than sometimes the ministers. Some people get it the other way around. But I am utterly convinced it's the people of God and the future people of God uh, in, in Wamburn and this area that, that is important. And uh, Pastor John uh, did speak a, a few weeks ago and he said, uh, and he recounted the experience of September last year when he spoke to God and God spoke to him. And then Deb spoke to him, and we've all heard that story, and it's worthwhile listening to again at some stage, I think, because it was a godly moment. And we have to recognise godly moments where God picks an an anointed man of God and gives him a vision, and then, boom, he also gives him the answer. And uh, so God is good, isn't he? In every sense and in every way. And Pastor John also said, Uh, that there's a time and a place for the right person in the right place at the right time. And I believe that we are at a juncture in this church where God has uh, ordained that moment. And and so I'm blessed to be part of it. I'm just a happy chappy and blessed of God. And, you know, I'll tell you, I can't go wrong. I never... But the, the the Lord blesses, so I've got a great family. But I've also got a new pastor in Pastor John, who actually was my youth pastor many years ago. I had to get that one in. And uh, uh, so he was my youth pastor. But I've also got another pastor in Pastor Deb. So really blessed in that. Um, so... Uh, We don't want to get too formal, but I do want to read scripture. See, in a previous generation, there was a lot of formality uh, about this. But uh, as we commissioning Deb as one of the the pastors in the area, but I also sincerely believe that I'm as much as important and you are as important as the official ministers, because we're all ministers But we have to highlight this point. We need leaders, don't we? And so in the commissioning uh, for Deb as one of the pastors for Wamburn um, to help lead the church, to continue a great work that was established years ago here. And uh, I've followed it through over the years. And God has been good to this church and is being good and will continue to be good. Uh, So as Deb helps lead the church to continue the great work, We're going to pray in a moment, and uh, I'll ask you all to stand. Uh, But uh, the only formality I'd like to bring to this is the Word of God, really. And so I've got um, one or two scriptures that came from Paul, the Apostle Paul, to uh, the younger pastor, Timothy. And uh, this is what he said. So he, he... Throughout Timothy, as you read it, you find these encouraging words, commissioning words, and actually charging words. So let me read some of them to you. It says, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, and for this we labour and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, and especially of those who believe And then you can almost see him turning to Timothy as I turn to Deb today and say to her, encourage her and say, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, 
in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message, Deb. And, and there's been many prophetic messages. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And then uh, in 2 Timothy, uh, it reflects on Timothy's background. And uh, Deb's got a similar background. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. And, and here's an encouragement. For this reason, Deb, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given you a spirit of timidity, but he has given you a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Bless the Lord. One more and then the charge. Do your best, therefore, to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And then finally, this was the charge that Timothy was given by the Apostle Paul. So, and I would say it for, to Deb and Alpha Deb, and in the presence of God, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside. But you, Deb, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And the Lord bless you, Deb, and uh, any other setting. I would throw my arms around you. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to invite everyone uh, to join with one of our uh, leading elders here, Stuart, and uh, he's going to come and pray. I'm going to pray as well. But uh, I'm going to invite everyone to stand and to pray your own prayer. As I lead in prayer and Stuart leads in prayer, uh, you say your own prayer. Uh, as well, over Deb. Um, we would have invited others uh, to perhaps give an encouragement or a prophecy or a word from God or whatever. And perhaps you can do that separately after, uh, privately with Deb. You may have something for her. Uh, so I'm going to pray and I invite Stuart to come and pray. But I think it'd be good if we could all stand. And uh, I'm just going to actually lay hands on Deb. Bless you, Deb. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Where's you? Come and join me, Stuart. Bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the provision that only comes from you. Thank you, Lord, for the times that only come from you. Thank you, Lord, that our times are in your hand. And uh, I bless you for Deb and for this moment and for this season. Thank you, Lord, for the vision and direction of the leadership of this church and for this role that she's been appointed to. And in that role, Lord, as we've read your word, uh, we would stand and say, Lord, bless her in each and every way. May she find many who are Aaron and hers to her Moses, I pray, who will uphold her in prayer. But more than anything, Lord, we look for your favour on her ministry. 
Thank you, Lord. It's all about you. And without you, uh, we are nothing. But we do say thank you, Lord, for providing Deb at this hour and this moment. Lord, will you just equip her for the season and the hour that we find ourselves in. May your blessing, anointing, your commissioning, Lord, your ordaining be upon her as we recognize it, Lord. We honor you. You are mighty God. Amen. I'll shout, I use my big voice. Uh, so this is my family, so I've got Adam, my husband, and Noah is my eldest, and Elijah, and Grace. There we are. We recognise it's not just Deb, it's, it's a family that are coming to work together amongst us. So can we continue to pray? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this family. We thank you for Adam, for Deb, for Noah, for Elijah, and for Grace. We thank you for the faith that you've put in their hearts. And we rejoice in all that you have done and that you have achieved so far in their lives. And Lord, we praise you for bringing them to the Kingsway Church for such a time as this. And Lord, we believe that you have great things in store for this family and for the wider Kingsway Church family. We pray your protection over Adam, Deb, Noah, Elijah and Grace. Lord, we know that Satan tries to attack those that step out in faith, those that seek to lead your people, that he singles them out. But Lord, we know that you are stronger, higher, mightier, and your works are so much higher than anything that the evil one could hope to try and do. So, Lord, we know we're in safe hands when we're in your hands. And, Lord, we ask that you will give Pastor Deb heavenly wisdom as she continues in the role that she's already been doing here, Lord, as pastor amongst us for many months now. And we pray that you will lead and guide her in the future. And, Lord, we ask, that you will give each member of this family a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit, that you will fill them to overflowing, that you will give them new gifts of your Spirit. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Fill Deb, Adam, Noah, Elijah and Grace, fill them, Lord, afresh with your spirit. Anoint them and appoint them for this role that you've called them into as a family. As I was preparing this, I thought those lovely words of that hymn by Charles Wesley, this, this is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power and neither knows measure nor end. As a family, may each of you know the love and the power of our great and awesome God as you continue in what he's called you into. God bless you all. Amen. 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 Great to be in the building. Great to have those in our overflow with us today in the building with us as well. Great for those who are still watching at home in some way, whatever way you're watching this, we are just great to be with you. And my title for today is, we'll get it up on the screen in a moment, it's called We're Coming Home. And I want to start by saying thank you to Pastor John and Judith for making me feel like I am home. Because it has been such a whirlwind of a few months and Pastor John and Judith have just made me so welcome and so I say we're coming home because they've made me feel like this is my home. And that's an incredible thing, isn't it? It's a precious thing. So I'm going to be reading today from the book of Ezra. And I'm going to be talking about coming home. 
There's a lot of football talk in our house at the moment. And lots of you will have heard the song, It's Coming Home, playing on your radios. And so I thought this would be an apt title for today for all of us. I'm not sure if football is coming home. We'll wait and see. But we're coming home, aren't we? It's so interesting that the very first time that I preached here, back in 2017, I remember saying that coming to speak at this church was like visiting family. I said that back then. And God obviously knew, didn't he, what was going to lie ahead for us all. So it is a privilege and an honor to be your associate pastor. I'm excited to serve alongside you and get to know you all a bit more now that we can actually speak face to face a little bit easier. It's been a strange time to start this new role, but I absolutely believe, and Paul said about his appointed timing, and I believe that he's brought all of us to this place here today to be a family together. And I know it won't always be easy, but I want to say right at the start that I am for you. I want you to know that you belong here and that we're going to do all we can to journey these next few years together. We're going to love each other. We're going to be kind to each other. And that's really important to me. I know it's been a really challenging time for every single person over the last 18 months for so many different reasons. But we are the body of Christ. And so we're going to work together. We're going to help each other. We're going to be gracious towards each other. And we're going to support each other through this time as things change again. And I'm so excited to see what God is going to do in us and through us. So before I read the text in Ezra today, let's just pray. Father God, you are so good. We thank you for today. We just pray as we hear your word today that you would speak through your word to each of our hearts. Make our hearts open and soft. Holy Spirit, speak to each person. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, in 2017, I was preaching actually in the upstairs room where some of our church are today before this incredible new extension happened. And I spoke about a very famous verse. And in some ways, today's message is part two of the preach that I did four years ago. Now, don't worry, I'm not expecting anyone to remember what it was. But I am going to be talking about Jeremiah 29, 11, which is what I preached about. And it was a famous verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And I explained back then that this verse needs to be seen in the context. It was at the very start of a 70-year exile for the Jewish people. They had been captured and they'd been taken away from their homeland in Jerusalem. They were taken as captives to Babylon. And I preached about how, even when things were not as we hoped they'd be, even when we felt like we were in exile, even if we were in a time of waiting, even in times of being separated from others and not living life as we expected, that we should still plan to bless others in our hard times, plan to be blessed ourselves, and plan to see promises fulfilled. And I gave the example of Daniel, who lived through this exile, but he still thrived, and he still stayed faithful to God in the midst of everything that was going on. Now, I don't know about you, but over the last 18 months, there have been many times when I've felt like I've been in captivity. Have you? Oh, locked in my own house. Can't see my friends or my family. I'm exiled from them. And so today I want to talk about what happens next in the story. Because the exiles then returned home. So we're going to read together from Ezra 1. It actually follows on from 2 Chronicles 36, which is the book just before it. And there's a crossover of text. So the context is here that there's been 70 years of captivity and it's come to an end. And 2 Chronicles, first of all, it says this. So the message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. And the land finally enjoyed its Sabbath rest, lying desolate until the 70 years were fulfilled just as, the, just as the prophet had said. So this is our context. 70 years are finished. And it's interesting that the land had a, had a rest. I know that our environment has definitely had some good things happen to it because it's had a time of rest from less activity. But I'm going to pick up now from Ezra, although there is an overlap in the text here. Now Cyrus was the king at this time. And so we read about what he did to bring the exiles home. And we're going to be reading from Ezra 1, 
verses 1 to 8. And the title in the New Living Translation is this, Cyrus allows the exiles to return. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he'd given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute towards their expenses by giving them silver and gold, supplies for the journey and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And all their neighbors assisted by giving them articles of silver and gold, supplies for the journey and livestock. They gave them many valuable gifts in addition to all the voluntary offerings. King Cyrus himself brought out the articles that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his own gods. Cyrus directed Mithridath and the treasure of Persia to count these items and presented them to Sheshbazar, the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. So we read here in Ezra that Sheshbazar led this group of exiles back home again in response to King Cyrus's new rules. The book of Ezra is located about halfway through the Old Testament. But it's helpful to know that some of the books in the Bible are not positioned in their chronological order. So if we were to put Ezra on a timeline, then it would be towards the very end of the Old Testament in terms of when it actually happened. The rebuilding of the temple happens here. And in the next book, Nehemiah, we hear about the walls of Jerusalem being rebuilt. So take a note that the books of Jeremiah and Isaiah were written actually many years before, and this is going to be important later. Now, I haven't included all the books that were written in this timeline, so Esther and some of the other books were written as well, but take note of the ones I've included. And what we read about in Ezra is the emergence of the Jewish culture that we then hear about in the New Testament in the time of Jesus being born. So there's a 400-year silence in the Bible, not long after this, and then we go straight into the Gospels. So we need to understand that God here is regathering his people, he's rebuilding his temple, and he's restoring them, and this is in preparation for and pointing towards the arrival of Jesus, who is our spiritual rebuilder and our restorer. So let's talk about these three points, regathering, rebuilding, and restoring. Firstly, regather. This is what we're doing today. God God had always planned for the exiles to regather. This moment had been prophesied about years ago. We already know that Jeremiah had told of the 70 years before they'd be back home together. And the prophet Isaiah had also spoken about this moment too, years ago before it happened. I want you to know today that God fulfills his promise. This moment of regathering was a fulfilled promise of God. We hear in Isaiah 43 that God had planned for a new thing to happen. And he was talking about this point in time, about the time of the exiles returning. Isaiah says these words that have become very precious to us as a church over the last few years, uh, last few months. Betty's display over the lockdown has, has really confirmed this for us. In Isaiah 43, 19, we see, we read, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Isaiah told the people there was a time ahead when their circumstances would change for the better. And our hope is the same for this church today, for Kingsway. We are starting a new thing. King Cyrus plays a crucial part in this story of regathering. In the next chapter of Isaiah, in chapter 44, we hear about exactly this moment of regathering that was prophesied and promised to the people. Isaiah was written about 150 years before King Cyrus was even born. Now, as I said earlier, we need to be aware of the chronology of the Bible, as the books of Jeremiah and Isaiah both come after Ezra, if you're just reading your Bible through. 
But in terms of time scale, their prophecies happened many years beforehand. And in Isaiah 44, 28, it says this. When I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he will certainly do as I say. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem. He will say, restore the temple. I'm sure that the Jews of influence at that time would have shown Cyrus the scrolls of Jeremiah and Isaiah, got them out and shown him that his name's in there. It might have even been Daniel who told him about it. So we know he was in a position of influence at this time. We don't know for sure, but Daniel could have been the one to show Cyrus the scrolls. Look, your name's in there. This is what's going to happen. And I encourage you that if there have been promises in your life, to remind yourself of them. And if you know of others who've had promises, remind your friends of them. Remind other people what promises they've had. Now, I know that Kingsway has had prophecies about being a multi-generational church. And so I'm reminding you of this today. And we stand on those promises. And we are already seeing how God is moving and making that happen. Back in February 2019, I was here again. And I spoke prophetically over this church, not knowing what would lie ahead for us all. That was only February 2019, how things have changed so quickly. But this is what I said to Kingsway Church back then. This is what I said. Let's believe Kingsway Church for a big move of God for this next generation that impacts every other generation too. I believe it will start with the kids and the youth and then the rest of us will catch it too. And that's what I spoke back then. And as I was reflecting on this whilst preparing for today, I realized we've already started to see this happen. So after our lockdown, what did we do? We started back with our kids and our youth ministries first. We started with our youth thrive. It's great to see some of our youth here today and we're going to have youth here again tonight. And then we had Quest and then we had our first steps toddler groups and our teams have worked so hard to get things in order. But isn't it interesting that we started first with the kids and the youth and then the rest of us have joined them. So as we regather today... It's good for us to share those moments when God fulfills promises. It builds our faith. So try and remember, has God promised you anything that you're still waiting for? Remind yourself of what he said and remember he's a faithful God. Ask him if there's anything that you need to be doing this week to play your part just as King Cyrus did. And it's in these moments of regathering that we can share our stories of how God has fulfilled his promise. Number two, rebuild. It's very obvious that Ezra clearly talks about the need for resources and finances for the temple to be rebuilt. And God knew that there was work to be done. And so provision was given in order for this to happen. And we read in verses four to eight, some of it came from the Jewish people themselves and some of it came from the king. And we've been blessed in the last year to receive a number of grants from the government for our building. And Keeley continues to work hard to find different funds for us. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has inputted into this building over so many years, either financially or through their time and serving and prayers. This is an incredible resource for our community. And I know God has got more plans for it in the future. So let's get ready for that. But thank you for what has already been done. This is our home. And I know for many of you, coming in today was an emotional moment. And in The Wizard of Oz, we hear Dorothy say, there's no place like home. And that's right, isn't it? We all know that church hasn't stopped in lockdown. We all know that the church is us, the people. But we also know that having a physical building, a home, where we can all be together, is a really special thing. And I think today we're especially aware of that. The reality is is that Kingsway will continue to need resources and finances in the years ahead. It's going to take all of us working together, and this includes our money and our time. So today's a great chance to just review that situation, and I know lots of you have done this in lockdown already. You've re-evaluated roles maybe that you need to put down or things that you want to step up into. You've evaluated your finance, and so I just encourage you today to continue to do that. Review where you're at and think about maybe how you can give in the future. We went on holiday in half term, the five of us, and we stayed in quite a small caravan, which with the five of us was very cosy. I've got a picture up in a moment. It wasn't as small as the picture I've got. 
It was a bit bigger than that, but not much. No, we had, a, we had a fantastic time, but it was so lovely to get home and have some space. Have you ever done that? You got home and your house seems to be really big because you've been in a small space. And it was so great to walk around the rooms and not bump into someone else. However, cleaning the caravan was a much quicker job than what I need to do when I'm back at home. It costs a lot more to heat my house, but it also allows me to be hospitable to other people. And we'd struggle to get everyone into the lounge in the, hosp- in the caravan, so hospitality is much easier to do when you've got the space. And if we're going to let others make this their home too, which is what we want, isn't it? Then we are going to need to resource it. We want a culture of hospitality here at Kingsway and for people to feel as they arrive that they are coming home too. We ultimately trust that God is going to provide for our church, but I'm just asking you to consider today how you're going to play your part in that. And if you are struggling financially in any way, please let us know. We believe that God is going to provide. Our family has its own testimony of God's provision to us during lockdown. There were times when we did not know whether the mortgage would be paid. So Ad and I were both self-employed. And early on in those early days, we had to sit down and pull together what we called our Corona Geddon plan. So if everything goes really wrong, how are we going to survive this? But God was our provider. So if you need help, then know that there's help out there and please talk to us and we'd love to pray with you about that. Finally, restore. The exiles are brought back home as a signpost towards Jesus being our home, our place of safety, our refuge. In Psalm 91 2, it says, He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. And I know that many of you, if not all of us at some stage, have felt broken and damaged by this pandemic. And I want you to know today that Jesus comes to restore and heal us. I love the image of the Japanese kintsugi pottery. It's an art form where people take jars and bowls which have been broken and cracked somehow and they get repaired with golden glue and they become much more valuable. So the whole process treats breakage and repair as part of the history of the object rather than something to disguise or throw away. And I know that there has been a lot of loss and hurt during this pandemic. And I know that God is the only way for us to be healed and restored. And it might be that we look different as we come through this, just like the bowls do. We might never look the same again. Many of our lives have changed in a variety of ways. But I believe that our God can still make beauty out of ashes. He can add value to our cracked jars In Isaiah 64, it tells us that he is the potter, we are the clay, and as we give ourselves to him, I believe he can make our lives beautiful again. Different, but still valuable and precious to him. In Ezra, the physical temple was being restored, and this is a symbol for our own restoration. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God lives in you. We're the bride of Christ, so let's make ourselves available for God to start restoring us in the weeks ahead. We want to move forward together, church. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Well, I want us to go far. And so we're going to move forward one step at a time and hopefully keep everyone together on the journey. So, in conclusion, the story continues from here as more people choose to join them. And I love that it's not a one-time opportunity for the people to return, because more people join later, and Ezra himself then leads the next group of exiles as they come back home. We do not want anyone to stay in lockdown, but we know that for some, the journey might take a bit longer. So if you're not here with us today, please don't feel like you've missed your chance. Our doors will be open next week, and hopefully the week after, and the week after, and the week after, and months to come. So when you're ready, come and join us. We'll be here ready for you. 
Ezra is an account of a group of people regathering in their homeland. It's a story of them rebuilding what has been taken from them. And it teaches us about reconciliation after a time of heartache and loss. And my prayer is that we'd all know this in our own lives in the week ahead. So let's pray. Will you stand with me? Lord, we just thank you that we can regather today. Even if it doesn't look quite like we expected, we thank you that we are here. And we are regathering online and we are regathering across the building. And we thank you for that. And Lord, help us as we begin to rebuild our, our lives, our community. Help us to be equipped. Give us provision for what we need to do in the years ahead, Lord. And we pray for restoration for each person here today, Lord, who feels broken or cracked in some way from this pandemic. We just pray for your golden glue, for your Holy Spirit to come and to begin restoring us. We just pray for physical healings. We pray for mental, emotional, spiritual healings. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd be with each person and each family represented here today. And we just, we just thank you for your goodness, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh,